quiet. There, what, that side is fine. This one wasn't. But there are guys in hard hats going from the lobby looking at me. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Five. I think so. <laughs> Folks, we're going to begin because um, we have a rather long agenda and hopefully a very interesting agenda, but we do not yet have a quorum, so we cannot approve minutes or today's agenda. I can just launch into my report. Um, so let me begin. Um, unless you've been in out of incommunicado the last couple of days, you know that we now have a new um, interim president to succeed. Um, yes, she, uh, Sarah Feinberg is a former FRA administrator. Uh, she has been chair of the transit committee here for um, almost a year, if not. Um, I certainly have gotten to know her. Um, she, she came in to meet with us in the office as well when she first joined. She came to meet with us in the office when she first joined the board also. Um, she's very knowledgeable on the issue of railroads and um, transit systems. Um, New York's is obviously a very special case, so we will see. Um, I'm sure she will get the support um, from Albany in as much as that's who appointed her, and um, hopefully we will continue um, with and the team and the assemble to move forward on a number of important items, accessibility, um, new signaling, and I have a lot more to talk about on that topic. And Lisa has a look at me, so she's going to say something, aren't you? I'm just going to say she's clearly got big Oxfords to fill, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but what we've what we've what we've said also is that she has a lot of managerial experience and knowledge and credibility. Um, she. She's in there for the interim. She doesn't want the position long term. She's going to help find the next president. Um, she cited her young child and family um, as reason, which, which I think which is a great. Which she cited when she was offered the position of chair of the entire MTA right. and turned it down. Right, she, and she has a relationship with the governor and understands the politics, which is very helpful. Um, and will hopefully keep the ship right during what is still a turbulent time. Uh, and with her. This is this is my pie in the sky. She's got still has relationships in the federal government through her FRA days, and relationships in Albany. So hopefully she can bridge some of the ish, um, and help us get congestion pricing going. That's my that's my dream. I have one. Well, I think I, thought was I think pie in the sky and pie charts should be made with real pies. I like that. That's what I got. Um, and just that she said she wants to continue what Andy's vision is, and that that was. Good to hear. Does she have any? Um, I mean, she's been at FTA. FRA. F oh, FRA. Yeah. Federal oh. Railway Administration. Red yeah. Real, okay. Um, but just had she run, and so no direct service provision. Don't believe she was running a transit system, if that's what you mean. No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, I sent her an email earlier to see if she's in the building and she can stop by. Um, so I'm waiting to hear for, on that. Maybe she will. Uh, maybe we'll be. Um, she'll be. Her schedule will allow her to stop in, but we will see. Um, some other items. Earlier in February, I went to a a ceremony for the extension of the free transfer between the three. Junior Street and the L. Livonia station on the border of Brownsville and East New York. Um, yesterday it was announced, not that we didn't know it was coming, that the Livonia on the L is going to be made ADA accessible. When I was there, I could not believe the steepness of the stairs up to that L platform. So this is very, very well uh, received. And um, of course, this is all a prelude to the next capital plan where an all enclosed um, transfer will be made between Livonia and Junius, which is so overdue. It's the second to the last place in the system that lines cross, but there's not been a provision for a 
direct connection, the other being Hughes Street and Broadway in Williamsburg. Um, so this is, this is very good news. Um, we look forward to that. Um, on a different kind of note, as a provision for passing the, out, the uh, congestion pricing program, which is still in limbo because the feds have not told the MTA what type of environmental assessment they will require yet, so this delays further the date that this can be put into effect. Um, and it's looking less and less likely that January of 2021 it will start, but hope springs eternal. Anyway, a number of elected officials from the Bronx and Queens um, started this Outer Borough Transit Fund, and as part of this, I think I announced last month, <laughs> which is very counterintuitive, if you're a Bronx resident, your toll will be removed from the Henry Hudson Bridge, and if you're a Queens resident, there will no longer be a toll on the Cross Bay Bridge. Um, in the form of a rebate. Yeah, in the form of a rebate, right. But to continue, they have now, and the MTA announced it, its press release is all over, every station on Metro North in the Bronx and every Long Island Railroad station in Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, um, will be getting a reduction in the, f in, the in the travel on Metro North and Long Island Railroad. Um, it's not nearly as good a deal as Atlantic ticket is. It's a 10% reduction in a one-way ticket, but also a 20% monthly reduction if you're a Long Island Railroad monthly uh, commuter from Queens. I don't know why Metro North, maybe their politicians weren't as adamant, but they did not get this from Metro North. This does not mean stations only from transit deserts. This means from every commuter rail station. Hi, Stuart. So, um, including Woodside and Flushing Main Street and obviously Atlantic Terminal and um, so this does not mean they're doing away with Atlantic ticket. That will remain. Um, that has been extended indefinitely, which is great. And, and the numbers are looking really good on ridership on that program. Um, we will see what this means. As I said at the board yesterday and in committee, Bradley and other staff members took exhaustive, res did exhaustive research to see where there were available seats where normal commuters from Nassau and Suffolk would not be um, uh, inconvenienced or have to stand. There was lots of available seats on the Atlantic branch, which is why um, Atlantic ticket proceeded. That and the fact that there was all kinds of Amtrak work going on in Penn Station and in the East River Tunnel, so we weren't sure what the schedule was going to be like there. So to make sure there were no standees on outbound trips, we did it to Atlantic Terminal. This program in the Outer Borough Transit Fund takes no such um, look at all of the existing conditions. And um, not only did I bring it up, but um, uh, Neil Zuckerman of the Metro North Council, of Metro North Council, Metro North um, Committee of the Board took it up. Um, um, Susan Metzger from Metro North took it up. We testified about and it. we testified about it. And there were a couple of negative votes on this yesterday. Um, but of course, it did pass, um, being the board being. Sheila, you want to say something? And then Lisa? Oh, it's be closer to the mic. Oh, oh, sorry. I did want to say something. So there, um, the analysis is going to be done after the fact. This is a yeah, yes. six to 12 month pilot program that should cost for the two railroads uh, upwards between 20 and $20 million uh, is the estimation that they put forward. And for the and each that Metro North and the and the Long Island Railroad did um, different methods of estimating, but the Long Island Railroad uh, pulled that number based on no new riders, but but the discounts on the existing ridership. And one of the concerns that we raised and continue to raise is crossover commuters, who come from you know drive over the border, and what is that going to mean to some of the you know, some of the communities that already have a lack of parking and, and traffic congestion. So, um, you know, we're looking, they're going to have some good data once they do this. Uh, and that's going to help to inform this. other discounts. And they, 
the um, in my conversations with the, with the MTA, they would much prefer to do an analysis beforehand. But this is not an option. This is the way it's going to be. This is legislation. This is legislatively uh, determined, and you know you gotta sort of give the elected officials some cred for getting this for their constituents. So you know, look at it in, in that perspective. That's the quote that we submitted um, for the MTA press release, and also that should there be additional ridership based on these discounts, that we hope that there will be uh, an attendant increase in service. And in the case of the Long Island Railroad, because there is a 20% 20, 20 discount on a monthly ticket, um, we can certainly foresee people from Valley Stream or Floral Park or Great Neck going across the line to buy their to buy their tickets. I think that's a no-brainer. Yes, Stuart. Advertise this, um, or just politicians will. Oh yeah. You know, like with the Atlantic. Ticket. Put the mic a little. The, with other the Atlantic way. ticket. Well, Even uh, the machines have that option. I mean, are they going to? They have. They have said, meaning, interestingly, not to not to doom the study, but yeah. uh, I think they have to program the machines that way. Um, but the uh, and it's also going to be available on eTix, which is not now the case with Atlantic That's Ticket. That's right. However, uh, if they advertise it the same way they're advertising Atlantic Ticket, then nobody's going to know about it. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Uh, unless, they, of course, the electeds make make it clear in newsletters and everything that which it's available, which they will do. You can be sure of that. So, um, even though uh, this is act well. It's going to start in May, is it? Uh, uh, I think as soon as May 1st. As soon as May 1st, mm -hmm. uh, if everything can get put into place. Um, right. So so the um, these projects through the Outer Borough Transit Fund uh, need to be approved by the CPRB, which just has not yet convened. Um, Good luck and with that. So, but it just the three members excluding the city. So um, the governor, uh, Carl Hasty and Andrea Stewart-Cousins have all said that they will serve themselves on the board, so they're the only three that need to take the action of approving this. Um, but we're sort of all curious and waiting and watching to see if that means they're going to convene and if they're going to do it in public because a vote is required. Yes. The, um, the, uh, the only thing that they did discuss, because I have it, some of the information from as the Long Island Railroad ADA Task Force, and I just sent it to Edith as well as I'll send it to you, Stuart. Um, the um, also that we're seeing is that platform F is also will be one of the test areas. There, that's what I'm hearing from Long Island Railroad. Just told me maybe on an email that they might be doing some testing to see if it you know works properly because they've been having computer system problems. So they've been they've been um, mm -hmm. quietly opened platform F last week with no fanfare early yet yeah, last week, and they're doing some runs. Phil Lang is reluctant to, has publicly stated that he's reluctant, reluctant to uh, follow the initial service model of having just everything going to Brooklyn go there. Good. Uh, and we, you know, but they're still studying it and figuring out um, how to, what kind of service they can do, how to make it the most efficient and effective without having to inconvenience tens of thousands of daily writers. Um, no, this is important. The only thing is they're still testing right now, Lisa, just to add, because they did show it on YouTube, on the YouTube page. They still have to fix, um, I think it's track 12, because they had to re-fix re it, because they said there was a loose uh, screw. Something has to be readjusted, so they're still doing some repairs. It was mentioned that right now they've been testing, seeing how the train can handle leaving and departing. And you're correct on the other th uh, the other parts. As far as changing the service pattern, I don't think they would dare do that prior to you gaining the benefit of east side access, uh, which is when what Platform F was actually constructed for. Um, and that's anyway. Um, some other interesting news is, and actually the time frame is what propelled this to be done sooner rather than later, which is the next um, tube under the East River to be fixed from the results of Sandy will be the Rutgers tube, which carries F trains. And the reason that is getting moved relatively quickly is because CBTC installation um, is two years away from the beginning 
from starting on the 8th Avenue line between Columbus Circle and High Street, Brooklyn, and in order to reroute F trains via the AC line, which is, which is, we're so fortunate to have a system that has the 6th and 8th Avenue lines interchangeable between J Street and West 4th. So before they can do that, they must repair the Rutgers tube. So that is going to start um, next week, uh, next week, next year likely, and um, will be obviously the same model as the Canarsie tube, um, which I like to refer to as um, repair light. Uh, and, um, and that will be done prior to the beginning of installation um, of CBTC on the 8th Avenue line, which we all would love to see. Um, more service is obviously necessary. And um, we got this document. Um, is this from a press release? Yes, yes. Press, release press release today, today that th um, you can see what projects, if you go on, I guess, on the website, are in the next capital program. And there's a lot of, uh, obviously, great projects. Penn Access, bringing uh, the New Haven line into a Penn Station, and four New Bronx stations is something we're all looking forward to. Um, CBTC. Obviously, CBTC, um, continuing the subway action plan. Um, just lots of great stuff um, in the, in the uh, capital plan, of course, Junior Slavonia, as I mentioned, and lots of, lots of uh, signal improvements. Um, we, we hope to see some, test, some testing on the Queens Boulevard line of CBTC relatively soon. Um, as I've said many times at meetings, that's great until you get to 47th, 50th Street when the signals are not <laughs> changed further and the trains will have to go the normal um, regulation. But um, obviously, it's made a big difference on the seven line, um, the first snowfall of the season notwithstanding, and all of the glitches that happened that day, and an occasional glitch here and there, but um, three or four more trains per hour is certainly welcome, so we'd love to see um, more CBTC installed. Let me see if I've heard from... Uh, um, by the way, I just heard about your issue with the B train from the head of subways, they are looking into what is causing this problem. She is aware of it, Sally Labrera. Okay? okay? Yes. Yes. So that was a that was a pretty good response. Great. Um, moving along. Oh, while we have a quorum now, can we get an approval of today's agenda? Great. Any objections? No. How about the minutes? Any corrections or additions? If not, can we get approval of the minutes? The motion to approve. Thank you, thank you. Can, can I also tell you my issue with the number six train, uh, which is not only we'll today. Get to, we'll get to Yeah, that. but you said somebody had an issue with the B train, yes. and that's why you didn't have a quorum, and that's why I am so late, and I am I, sick. I had a feeling I'm it was so a train tired issue. of hearing about how the trains are running on time. Yeah, they seem to be, but when they pass by stations, especially locals, it is it registers as being on time. But it isn't because it passed. I'll, if you want Maybe me to bring it up the on the station, so they can keep on time. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's not funny, Andrew. Not when you then finally get on a train and people are practically being pushed off the platform, like happened today. That's not funny. But I no, it's not funny. And if you want, I'll wait until new business to Please bring do. it up. But I, this is actually it's old business, if you must know. It, it's old business, the and issue. then it was per. It was supposed. It's. Screwed up business is okay. what it is. We'll have a new category. Um, so, also um, approved in yesterday's board meeting was the purchase of a large quantity of open gangway cars for the R262 fleet, which will replace the R62s. Um, you happy about that, or you're not so happy? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Interestingly, when we ordered the R211 fleet, we did a sample of 30 or 40 cars, something like that, of open gangway so that we could test them out and see how they behave in the New York environment. The order yesterday um, sort of discounts that, although I have been told after raising the issue that there will be a suitable amount of time that the test trains of the R211s are in service and it will not be too late for them to change the open gangway order of R262s if things aren't going as intended. Um, because, you know, 
in one breath, you you want to you want to sample and see how they work, and in the next breath, well, let's order another 400 cars. The heck with how the sample uh, proceeded. Hopefully, they will work well, um, and um, they will be safe, and they will keep the cooling and air conditioning in place. There will be less falls between trains. Um, I hate to say it, but less urinating between trains, um, less other things between trains. Um, and but we yes. We will see how that, yes, Edith. The removal or the lack of horizontal up and down poles yep. is a real problem. Mm -hmm. um, people, unless you're so packed you can't fall, it's incredibly dangerous. Are we ever going to look at that question? It, I mean, it is, I can't hold on to anything. There is no pole. Is, it is, do you have a car type we're referring to now, or is it, what trains? That'll help me. Uh, well, right now, today, it was on the one train coming down. That's our 62 It was, on the, two, it was okay. the two, three. Okay. Because I switched at 96, and I cut back on a one. Um, That's 142s. The ones yeah. that have the open space with no fold-down seats. Okay, yeah. Okay, there's just nothing to hold on to. Are you talking about in that open space or the length of the car? <clears throat> there's nothing to hold on to from the end of the car until a good two to three feet in between the seats. So for me to yeah. sit there, I'm blocking everyone yeah. to hold on to a pole. Now, Pete, I, you know, my, my chair is a great big heavy thing. But you should see the manual chairs. The manual chairs are just going skidding back and forth because those brakes are not brakes. They're just little levers that that go against your your, your front wheel. So, and I mean it's so baby it's not carriages. only cars that where the seats have been removed for a for a wheelchair um, on the ends. It's it's ba basically all of the cars you just said. Okay, so Everything. It's, one, it's 62, 62As, and 142s, which is the lines you just mentioned. So, right. Okay. Yes. I mean, there's no car coming in. 68s. Um, it, that's interesting because when we when we saw when the, we saw the, the model in, and we all commented comment. at Javits Center. Uh, well, I saw it at. Where did we? Yeah, we did. She's the okay, one it was Yard. Hudson Yard, Yard yeah. right? Same place. Same place. And, I, and I did make the complaint. Now, theoretically, I'm going to be sitting against the wall where those seats fold up. Fold up. Yeah, right. It's going to be baby carriages. Mm -hmm. It's going to be people standing there with their luggage. Keep going. It's <laughs> it's going to be you know the rolling Unless dolly. Unless you got there first. <laughs> Unless I get there first, yeah. right? right That's right. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also have this insidious little way of inching into it and making people move. I mean, the signage is clear that it's for people. Nobody cares about yeah, but, but signage is, yeah. yeah. Um, can I add what she's saying also? Cause I have the same issue, and I brought this up. Can you add to what she's saying? Thank yes, you. you Again, the issue is, I agree with you, because when I have to get on and help a senior or disabled person, and it could be anyone, including my mother or my cousin or whoever, the issue it still comes in that even on an R160, the signages, and I have mentioned this before Alex even came in, they're so small, and you know, it's like, I'm like getting a little tired of hearing all these excuses from the old CC group, which I'm not saying their names, but one of them is not here anymore, is, oh, we can't make an enlargement. Forgive me when I say this, that's a lie, and that's all I'm gonna say, because this sign could be say it, a Edith. 40 spot. Thank People you. are not gonna that's move there. Thank you. So, you know, the fold down seats in the, in the corner? Thank you. I mean, you know, it's like, and the worst is going from here uptown. Mm. I, you know, I get on here if I'm so lucky that it's working. And, you know, trying not to go too far in because I'm only going as far as Fulton. Because if I go in, I'm not going to get off at Fulton. And I'm going to be stuck on so, the Lexington. So the reasonable answer to your issue is it's unlikely they will retrofit 
cars of the vintage of 62s and 62As with additional poles. I'm concerned about the new ones New right car now. orders, absolutely. The, you know, and it's, that's the issue. Um, so I will ask if we um, can get an advanced look at 211s and 262s before they are set in stone so that we can see what what the handholds, what the accessible air features are, and what the layout of the cars are proposed to be. How would that be? Get a on it. Um, hopefully, um, I mean, if, if Kawasaki is, is the builder, and, and they certainly are on the 211s, they might have a set at, in Yonkers that we might be able to, to get to. Um, obviously, we're not going to Nebraska, but... Um, not until June. Yeah, okay. Um, let me continue, please. Um, so about six months ago, I went to um, a public hearing at St. Francis College in Brooklyn Heights on Remsen Street um, that was held by Assembly Member Simon, um, New York City Transit, obviously, and some other electeds who represent um, downtown Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights to talk about possible scenarios for replacement of the three really old and really in poor shape elevators at the Clark Street Station. Um, Andy was there and um, did a terrific job, as Andy always did. Um, there were a few possible ways to, to treat it. It was to sh take all three out of service, shut the Clark Street Station for approximately eight months, get in, get out, and, and be out of there. Obviously, that had um, problems for the businesses that are housed and paying rent in the Clark Street Station in the St. George Hotel. Um, the, one of the other scenarios was take one at a time out, which would have extended the project to approximately two years, but would have kept the station open, kept the businesses um, obviously open and accessible. And the other was to do two elevators at a time, shut one down and do it that way, and then just reverse the order. And um, Andy was so convincing at that meeting um, that um, pretty much the people in the audience, and there were close to 100 people there, um, voted to do it all, shut it down. Um, it was advertised and acknowledged that the businesses would remain open, signage would be placed outside the building to alert uh, residents that the businesses inside were still going to function, were still going to be open. Don't know if, it, if there would be any adjustment in their rent in, a, in as much as they would not have the traffic they would normally have. Um, there were a few worries um, from people about um, access to other lines, and Brooklyn Heights, fortunately, is anything but a transit desert. There's um, a number of other subway lines less than two blocks away, Borough Hall, um, High Street, um, so Court Street on the, on the R. So um, there was talk of a possible jitney to take folks that needed that well, a shuttle to Jitney, um, a small bus to take people from one station, from Clark Street to adjacent stations. Um, don't know what happened to that, but the final decision was reached, and they will be doing the final, the entire shutdown, and uh, get in and get out. Don't have the timetable when that will start yet, but um, for that period of time, there will be no stops between uh, Borough Hall on the 2-3 and Wall Street on the 2-3. Um, uh, yesterday, Jano announced that that was going ahead, and he couched it in. This is Andy's, one of Andy's last decisions was to shut down the station. It's like, oh, so I'm under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just one thing, uh, with also was the, I thank you, Trudy. Um, the one thing they also mentioned regarding the shuttle, because the people were concerned about accessibility, but as to remind them, Clark Street is not really ADA accessible because it only goes to the lower mezzanine and then there's stairs to the platform. The problem is, is um, a lot of those passengers don't want to understand. You don't really, the shuttle buses, you don't need a shuttle bus. There's no way you can fit a shuttle bus in those really tight streets. And a lot of the passengers, which a lot of people who live over there, do take the B25 to the J Street Metro Tech or Borough Hall or DeKalb Avenue for those accessible stations. And they actually said it's easy for them to do that. The only complaint they have is, is are you going to increase the 25 a little bit or give more uh, leeway because they think the 25 takes too long or you have to wait almost 30 minutes. That's the main complaint they've been having. So that's the main issue.
So stay tuned on when that, yes, Andrew. I need you to come up and speak in a mic if you don't mind. Now your name is Mike. A <laughs> uh, quick question because it does affect all of this uh, area in the sense of the Rutgers uh, Street uh, project and also the closing of the uh, elevators at Clark Street. It, I mean, uh, is it that they're talking weekend, they're doing the weekends, or uh, what are they, you know, because you know, one does affect the other in that regard in that area. Uh, we tr trying to figure out the, are the you services. Asking, are you asking the time frame for the work on the Rutgers tube or the time frame for the Clark Street close? Well, uh, basically a combination of both. Because people, people who, were, who are being inconvenienced by the closure of Clark Street would likely not walk all the way to York Street. They would go to High Street no. or Borough Hall. No, I am, no, no, I understand that. Yeah. I'm not, that, that's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about because you're, the, you're, you know, you're alternating the trains and the reroutes and stuff because of it. It does, does, you know, if you do the mapping and stuff of it, it is uh, something that needs to be somewhat addressed in the sense of being figured out. Um, I will certainly raise that, that issue. Um, the third quarter of, of 2020. 20, yeah of 2020 is when they're gonna, yes, because they will be done with the L train uh, this April, so they will begin um, later this year, the uh, Rutgers II work. They gotta get that going so that they can be on schedule for the CBTC 8th Avenue installation in two years, so. They don't have Clark Street on No, slips. they don't, yeah. I'm not surprised. Um, okay, so moving forward, um, some really good news uh, continues in on-time performance. Um, it's still ratcheting up on, a, I know, Trudy, I know. Okay, um, but it is up higher than 83% now, um, which, is, which is pretty amazing that we haven't lost any ground. Um, hopefully, President Sarah Feinberg will keep this momentum going. Um, one of the things that absolutely propels better on-time performance is the Save Safe Seconds program and lesser dwell time in stations. And I've seen now platform personnel with, with lights and helping to move people through more quickly so they can shut the doors more quickly. I'm not talking about your trip today, Trudy. Uh, no, I'm not talking about my trip today. If it was just today, I'd say it was, a, it was something strange. I, am, I, w I have a question, sure. I'm not going to, which is the statistics on on-time performance it's when the train is scheduled to come into a station and leave it, right? That's what's considered on time. If it gets to the station on the time it's supposed to. Do they take into consideration when the train just zooms past the station, which it does on a regular basis. It was not just today on the number six. I can't tell you how many times that has occurred, especially in the last month. That would get added to the wait time in stations uh, how does it? How does it wait time? Because it's not waiting. It just it gets it's into the station and goes out of the station. It's wait time because you didn't get the train you thought you were but getting. But you're not listening to me. I am asking I you am a question. I am listening to you if we're okay. going to speak in that then fashion. Then my question is, how do they consider on time? Is it that it gets to the station when it's supposed to? Within terminal to terminal, to terminal and, w and then they do it at midpoints and within so many minutes okay. of its scheduled so arrival. So then, then there is no yeah. consideration if it's terminal to terminal or midpoints that it passes by stations in order to make its on time thing. Can and I, I ask am you a saying question, that Trudy? all of those statistics are absolutely fallacious, at least on the number six line. The train that bypassed you today, did it have people on it? Two trains. Did they have people on two it? Two I really didn't look. I just oh. went zooming through. Yes, they always have people on them. On other times. Not if it's a train that was taken out of service. They it don't. wasn't taken out of service. It just goes zooming through. Okay. I just asked Sharon because she takes the, the at at Grants, oh, well, she gets on at 59th Street. No, I will tell you that it goes, this has, goes on sometimes. Sometimes I will note a number on a car, and then when I get to Grand Central, I will take a look. Because at 59th Street, you got to go up and down to get. Okay, to I have a really important question. Go ahead. 
when that happens to you, it would really behoove you to help us to look at the train and tell us if that was a six that was bypassing you or if it was an express that happened no, to be on the local track. No, it is always a six. It is always a six. Because sometimes they do run on the local because I a know problem. when they do. I know the okay. difference between four, five, and six. I can actually read well, the numbers. But if you didn't look at the train, you would I have looked at the train. not today. It happens okay. on a regular basis. Trudy, the your four question and the five run on the right. number six on the weekends and at certain times. So your the, question is in the data, and I think we can ask this question, is how is it's calculated when a train is bypassing a station, how that's accounted for in its metrics, in its platform is it, metrics. No, the question is, is, okay, is, is, it, is it accounted is it? for? That's the question and we'll you've ask. just said that it's terminal to terminal with maybe a midpoint. It is that? not you arriving at each we'll station when it's supposed Chris, to. Chris has some info for you. I do have one thing I did find out today because I was on the email because someone was asking me, uh, when the six, there was a sick customer reported on. And please, Trudy, let me speak. I'm because I'm. You're not. You're right. What you you have the right to complain because there was one problem that someone did complain to me. They do not make an announcement when that train is bypassing the station. Times on when the one train does bypass, it does make an announcement. There is some problems with the computer voices, Andrew. So that's the one issue. It needs to be brought up because. There was a complaint at 23rd when a six train does bypass. It doesn't say this train is bypassing. The next train is not going to arrive for like five to six minutes. It That's doesn't. interesting because I've heard but when a train is bypassing. I'm talking about stations. some of the computer uh, stations. Chris, on this train with all due respect, 77 is above 23rd. These were trains coming from above 77th and passing 77th. We got it. it is not what goes on down. At, with all due respect, usually they will announce in the station not that there's a, a but that there is a problem and the train is being delayed that i understand but not just zooming by we got it we'll find out how they figure that sharon just to comment that i was at 86th street at 11 o'clock and there was a huge bunch of people waiting and very possibly they decided to make one of the trains express after which they do sometimes when there's a big crowd. When you were at 86, were you on the uh, local or express level? Uh, you, I was. I entered on the local, but then I caught the express. And the people were waiting on the local there level. There's a huge wait at the local, okay. which is why I went down. Yeah, that was an issue. Edith, except that this was at 11:15, oh, right. and from 11:15 until 11 th or whatever time I called you, Sheila. Finally, okay. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. I got an announcement this yesterday afternoon at one six between one sixty eighth and one seventy five. There's traffic ahead. We I had waited like eighteen minutes for the A at one twenty fifth. So I don't know what traffic there was ahead of us between one sixty eight and one seventy five. And that's very frustrating. Also I have been on the A train, and we have been held. They close the doors, and then we're held for two minutes. Mm -hmm. And they tell you we're being held for two minutes. <clears throat> now, if we're held at five different stations for two minutes, we're now being held for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. How is that ever going to be 83% on time? How do, I mean, do they, do they then automatically add the two minutes at this station and add two minutes at the next station and we're it's just a very it's a very confusing to me as a passenger mm -hmm. I'll, I'll and, get you know you an and, and it'll be like you know we know we know where there are intersections I mean obviously all of us have been involved in delays we know that that's, but it'll that's be a like statistic that doesn't necessarily mean that much to us but I have heard from people they thought the trains were coming more regularly than they have in a long time. But Stuart. I will say over yes. eight months ago, excuse me, I'm sorry. Sure. It, I mean, I'm definitely waiting less time at 9 p.m. going uptown on the A, where, where 15 to 20 minutes was normal. Now it's 13 minutes. But 13 minutes is being accompanied by what seems to be fewer trains. 
So you're ending up with, you know, the, the bigger in between. But it's just, you know, it's insane. I mean, they will be, as you're coming down 14th Street, West 4th, etc., and it will be two minutes at each one. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. We know all that averages lie, um, <laughs> but I don't know the answer to this, Andrew, whether the data is public facing or not. It's on. Okay. And I'll speak louder. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> averages lie. We know that. The, I'm not sure if the answer, the data is publicly facing. So we're getting a monthly average of on-time performance. So the pain that our colleagues are speaking about is real and what they hear. Do they share with you or can they share with us um, whether, they're, whether they're different averages at different times of the day? Maybe in the morning rush we're reaching those goals. Maybe in the afternoon rush we're reaching those goals. Maybe at night we're not reaching those goals. I'm, I'm making that up. But uh, if you get the figure as an average, um, it's not telling you the real picture. You know, Ellen, mean, median, mode. There, there are other ways of measuring data. I, I, think, I think it's a valid question. I think people's pains are real and, and uh, how we ask for the data, meaning a monthly percentage may not tell you whether there are differences during the different pattern, you know, uh, different route patterns during the day. So, you know. so, yeah, and so there, there are a couple of things there, because um, I've gone into the um, behind the dashboard, the data that's being put into the dashboard. Um, you're, they don't have exact time precise, but they have peak, off peak, weekend, Saturday versus Sunday and having gone into some of that so so is it as rosy as they say if you look at it that way you know I haven't looked at it. <laughs> there's an accuracy to what they're saying but what's interesting is when you break it out by line you know that's the overriding one but there's the best performing lines which is closer to the two three and then there's the worst the F and the A is not doing so hot, and the four or five has made tremendous progress, but it's real it's not there yet. The six, I'm sorry, you're right, you're right. The six the six is Oh, rough. we need to move on, folks. We got an agenda. Yes, sir. Did I Am I on? All right, perfect. Um good afternoon everyone. My name is Andrew Pollock. I'm with Passengers United. Um I want to mention something about on time performance and how I was affected this morning coming over here. The uh, Queens Boulevard line had two problems. So um, the first issue was, making sure I got it right here, we had an A train. The brakes were automatically activated on the local track at 42nd Street Port Authority. Then, right before new, 1130, yes, I got the time right. Trains brakes were automatically activated at Queens Plaza. So today, coming over here, I had to take the F which the F didn't have any issues this morning, and I'm very glad to say that. And then what I had to do is put 135 additional on my Metro car because I'm a disabled customer. I had to walk from 63rd Street in Lexington to 59th and then take the Ford train down here this morning. So I also want to go on the record and say I watched um, Sally's presentation at, com at the uh, committee on Monday, and I noticed... The E and the F train performance is slightly going down in on-time performance. So I'm hoping when Sarah becomes the president that she's going to get involved and say, we got to make this on time. Because thankfully, when Andy was president, he made sure that the trains were running on time on the Queens Boulevard line, especially the E and the F. I believe that CBTC installation is affecting on-time performance on the Queens Boulevard line. That's what I was thinking, especially on the 7 as well, on the Flushing line. By the way, line. you could have just taken the R down on Whitehall Street from Queens Plaza. Right, but I wanted to save time this morning. You have to walk from 59th to 63rd if you had done that. But the fastest way was I did this morning. So Thank you. Here. Um, yes, our presenter is here, so let me just wrap up my report, if I could do that. Um, the transformation, uh, more details on the quote, transformation, unquote, were announced yesterday. And, you know, it's 700 operational positions, and it's a little scary. Um, 
Uh, jo John Samuelson from Local 100 was very vociferous at yesterday's meeting about that will make overtime skyrocket. If you have less people working, more people will have to perform overtime. Uh, Vinny, yes, from um, the Long Island Railroad Union. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Norman agreed from Metro North's union. And um, uh, interestingly, um, our speaker at next week's full PCAC is Anthony McCord, who will speak about transformation, um, what it means. Uh, he has he has at least explained in private that he wasn't brought here to be a hatchet man. He really would like to improve the efficiency and operational success of the MTA. But with that big a reduction in workforce, it's it's going to be really hard to accomplish all that we want to. With and you know, hopefully, the best people aren't the first ones to leave, and that's always a problem if it happens. So. Um, you will hear a lot more about transformation next week, uh, a week from today at full PCAC, so hopefully you can make that. Um, lastly, we are continuing to prepare for our fare evasion study. Um, we will be meeting with the IG. We will be meeting with um, transit officials so that we can frame the study and make sure it is done in the correct way. But I don't know about you, but every time I ride now, I'm seeing more and more. I saw the most athletic move over a turnstile yesterday I've seen in years. It's a limbo it was, wonder. It, no, this was really, you, if you didn't look, if you looked fast, you would not have known that he didn't pay. He was really great. Um, but it's, you know, it's costing money. We don't want it to affect service, obviously. That is the worst of all possible. And we don't want more frequent and higher fare hikes, which a loss of $300 million, which is what they approximate last year's loss is, and I have a feeling that's conservative, um, is, not, is not looking good. Yes? No. no. Quick question about fare evasion since you brought it up. I notice on the subway platforms the, elect, the new electronic advertising is recruiting I for fare evasion agent. Uh, it sounds like a new title to me. I'm not familiar with it in the civil service system. I'm wondering if you know anything more about it. Are they peace officers? I presume they're unarmed. They do carry badges around their neck. I saw the sign. And do they work for the city the, or the state? I'd just like to know more about it. And um, maybe we could follow up with the chief of the MTA yeah, police. We're going to be meeting with somebody who can give us the answer to that today, and we'll get back to you. Okay, uh, thanks. Andrew, it is my understanding that these are, I forget what they're called. I used to call them the Gestapo, but Eagle they're not. Team. The Eagle Squad is, is this is the same as the Eagle Squad, that they're going to be expanding the Eagle Squad to deal in the subways also besides the, that's what I was told when I inquired about it. I will ask. Uh, just uh, because they were originally supposed to be only for the SBS. Yes. But. Now, so if you could find out about Absolutely. that, because that might answer his question. They're just calling the same thing, same position under a different name. Yeah, I will so, ask. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, quickly want to mention this morning at Kew Gardens Union Turnpike, um, I actually, well, normally I go on the other entrance where 78 Drive is, so this morning, I instead went on the elevator where the Chucky Robinson Parkway was, and as soon as I'm trying to swipe my Metro card, there's already somebody who's offering free swipes. Mm -hmm. So I'm very glad you bought this up today. It's a problem. Um, when we get Omni, that will become less of a problem, and there'll be proof of payment, So, and there'll be all-door boarding for the buses, and you'll tap, so it'll be obvious right. someone who didn't tap. So that will be better, but the subway, Fair and Andy and I discussed this before he left. It's a sieve. Right. It's so easy to get in. Mm -hmm. Especially, yeah. especially how let's say, and I know this for a fact, with the emergency door. And I've seen I've seen Vera Evasion a lot at Kew Gardens Union Turnpike over the years. I've seen people go underneath the turnstile. I've seen people obviously hold the emergency exit open. And you know, I think Dave has a good idea to hopefully prevent any more view, future Vera Evasion incidents. Dave. David Poultry. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Let's let's go to our speaker since she is here on time. Um, we're pleased to have Yaling Chen. Did I pronounce that correctly? Close Yaling. enough. Yaling. Yaling. 
see if I say it my way, I can go, yay, Ling. Yeah. Uh, uh, currently, Deputy Director for MTA Arts and Design. Um, you've all seen a lot of the results of Arts and Design's um, works in our subway system and has made the system a lot more appealing, a lot more welcoming, um, and I think a, a nicer place to be. So um, Yaling is going to tell us w about their efforts and what their next efforts are going to be and um, where. So welcome. Hello? Yeah, you can bring the mic closer to your mouth if that's easier. Good. There you go. Um, yeah, they're going to be on all these screens. Okay. Should we dim the lights or no? I don't know if you have to. I don't think you can either. Everything's locked now. Really? Yep. Is it, is it up? Not working? Yeah, it's um, the screen, the presentation is not coming up on the oh. screen. That's pretty. Lisa, I see the vision of 2020. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, I see a new vision. Right? Yeah, thank you. Wallpaper, right. They're, they're coming. Not me. I did it. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you ready? Okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Yaling Chen, and um, can you talk um, Move that closer. Okay. The mic closer. Good enough. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Great. So um, it is uh, my absolute pleasure today um, to share with you all about arts and design and our role uh, in these extraordinary improvements that have happened since the early 1980s. So um, there are multiple screens here, so just uh, f make sure you are, you find the right one that, um, that suits you the best where you are. Um, so my office, arts and design as we call now, is uh, mandated to introduce visual art and live performances in the system um, serving more than 8 million people who ride subways and commuter rail trains every day. And uh, our mission is to encourage the use of public transportation in the metropolitan transportation area. We um, serve as the internal advocates for art and design and have been charged with continuing the mandate set forth by the founders of the subway who believe that Every design element in the system should respect and enhance the experience of the customers we serve. Our story uh, begins with folks like Mayor McClellan and William Buckley Parsons, who had this incredible forethought to build the first subway line in New York City back in 1898 in order for New York City to grow and prosper as a metropolis. This um, original contract, which we call Contract One, was executed on February 21st in 1900, with allusions to the city beautiful urban planning movements, which held that beautification and monumental grandeur would improve social conditions of cities and towns. This clause here, uh, up on the screen, was added to the original IRT contract. This line in the original contract set forth a policy that many years later would foster an opportunity for the uh, establishments of arts and design so that the subway would include art as a living, breathing underground museum. 
This is a photo of uh, City Hall decked out for the party uh, when the first subway line was officially open to great celebration and fanfare on October 27 in 1904. Since the very beginning, the subway's uh, chief engineer and architects were uh, designing phenomenal spaces with the idea of place in mind. As um, stated in the original contract, the contract one, and also as seen this uh, early rendering uh, of the city hall station and when it was built, uh, which now is it's closed, um, the station were planned with a view to the beauty to their of their appearance as well as to their efficiency with uh, Gustavino arches, um, brass chandeliers, and Tiffany leaded glass skylighting. At stations, um, as we uh, we can see every day on our commute. Durable and easy to clean ceramics were the, the materials of choice. Unique decorative features announced stops, distinguish stations from one another, and instill a sense of character and place into each station, often referencing um, below ground what's above. However, by the 1970s, the mass transit system in New York began to strangle. As money moved from infrastructure project to, build, uh, to building new roads and highways. Over a 20 year period, the system fell into disrepair as shown in these um, graffiti written subway cards and um, That's the not inside. That's transit project? No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Um, <laughs> so, um, riding the subways becomes unsafe. Um, so, and then uh, eventually aesthetic considerations had long been abandoned and the subway was on the brink of a collapse. Luckily, uh, in a collective effort to revive the system, there are a, a, key, a few key initiatives that have happened at the time. First, um, the five-year capital improvement programs that was uh, established on January 1st in 1982, which continues to this day, uh, that we all know very well. Second, uh, New York City Transit started the uh, clean car program, which means that if there's a car that's covered with graffiti, they'll just um, um, sort of park the train into the yard to not allow the train roll out until they are thoroughly cleaned. And um, in the same year, in 1982, New York City passed the Person for Art legislation for all city properties. Um, Deputy Mayor and MTA board member at the time, Ronay Menchel, uh, she ensured that this Person for Art policy be included in the MTA capital projects and funded um, the Office of Arts for Transit, which it was what we were called um, before in subsequent year. The investments through these efforts pay off. Within around five years, subway cars were clean of graffiti on the outside, and the first group of newly rehabbed stations were clean, well lit, and well designed, and created an environment that evoked the city beautiful ideal and brought out the sense of better nature of people. Those, uh, I'm gonna show you a, a quick before and after photos uh, just to demonstrate how, how dramatic some of those station transformations were. For example, this is Astor Place in the 1980s. And after, with our work by Milton Glaser, who is a famous um, graphic artist that play off the original ceramic ornamentation by architects uh, who built the station. It was one of our first projects um, that we commissioned back in 1986. I'll, I'll wait till you're through, but you've left out a whole period of time from 1980 to, no, but I'm just saying that, the, I said I, but don't, that was not 1986, believe me, it was much earlier. The project? And there was something called the Culture Stations Project, 
There was another thing called adopter station. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I only have 20 minutes, I really do have to kind of make it short and sweet. But yeah. thank you so much for the. Oh, thank you, thank you for uh, for the information. But we'll go back to that. Okay. That okay. Um, okay. The second. This is a uh, 59th Street Lexington Avenue station before the artwork uh, installation, and um, now we have these um, immersive uh, mosaic artwork by Elizabeth Murray, uh, completely wrapping around this uh, station's transfer area, and um, featuring stepping shoes and steaming coffee cups, which is sort of part of the commuting ritual. At Columbus Circle Subway Station, before our work was installed, the station was uh, re been rehabbed. And now, a wall drawing by Soloet. <laughs> um, the swooping curves intermix with vertical and horizontal bar in vibrant hues. It's consisting of 250 porcelain tiles in six colors. Um, if you know um, uh, what the work type of work Solo w it was doing, uh, he is uh, really uh, the precision of the line and color is something that's really uh, mean, mean, mean meant a lot to him. So we were able to um, have those tiles to cut and to meet his very precise specifications. At Bleecker Street, uh, in early construction phase. And now, um, with Leo Valario's LED light sculpture uh, called Hive, um, this honeycomb shaped work is constantly changing patterns and never repeat itself, providing a new experience for writers with their every visit. And the connection between the six and the Correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At um, Rockaway Boulevard Station in Queens on the A, uh, this is uh, uh, one of those very typical um, elevated with uh, old type of windscreen. Um, now, hundreds of color glass discs uh, animate and enliven the movements of our passengers passing through the station. The artwork is meant to generate an, a type of interactive experience by inviting the travelers to lo look through the colored bezels or to follow the shadow that they would create. Right, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, continue on. Um, what was once a drab platform at the uh, 20, 20th Ave station in um, the uh, Bensonhurst neighborhood in Brooklyn um, is now reinvigorated with artwork by Odili Dano Odita. It's composed of 40 uh, laminated glass panels of vibrant patterns in those diagonal movements, which is the artist's uh, observation and translations of the vi vitality and diversity uh, within the, s the neighborhood's uh, businesses. And most recently, uh, just uh, towards uh, early last year, a total of nine stations along the Sea Beach Line on the end underwent renovation. Um, so this is the one of the nine stations uh, at Avenue U. Uh, the architecture is quite unique. It has those open cut um, platform architecture. Now uh, each station uh, receives improvements, uh, including art, such as the mosaic artwork here um, that on the screen by Maria Barrio at Fort Hamilton Parkway. And another one, um, it's a kind of abstract uh, artwork in glass mosaic by Eamon O'Giran at uh, Bay Parkway. So um, arts and design, is, uh, as we are now known, we not only administer our main permanent percent for our projects. We also have a diverse range of programs uh, under our um, taking. So those are including the graphics program, digital art program, live box program, uh, poetry in motion, which is very popular to our music uh, program. 
So each year, um, through our graphics program, we invite graphic artists and illustrator to design transit poster and art card um, for us. And these are our newest commissions that I think um, many of you have already started to spot them at stations and subway cards. Huh? Yes. Those are the new ones. These, these two are the posters, and these two are the art cards. We then, um, from that point, we then work with the illustrators who animate their design for the digital screens that are now available throughout the entire system. This is a earlier animation, because right now we are working with the newest, um, the illustrator who created the, newest, created the newest art card to animate their work. But I just want to show you, um, it's very short, but sort of be able to animate this uh, static uh, poster is um, quite charming. Right. Right. Yes, yes, correct. So uh, in November 2014, on the uh, opening day uh, of Fulton Center, we took this opportunity to launch our newest digital art program. Um, Fulton uh, is MTA's first uh, fully digitally integrated public space and transit hub. So with a network of 52 screens um, in different sizes throughout the entire buildings, many level, this network provided an ex exciting opportunity for us to introduce immersive art by new media artists to public space and also to MTA readership. So far we've uh, commissioned seven artists uh, to create a uh, digital artwork. This one is what's currently on view at Fulton Center. It's called um, Set Pieces by um, mixed media artist R Rashad Newsom. It's uh, sort of like kind of featuring a kaleidoscopic uh, portraits of book dancers that's kind of in a digitally rendered environment with the Baroque architecture. Um, as a way to kind of celebrate this uh, popular culture and also the kind of energy uh, our city has cons constantly um, emitting. Uh, the digital artwork is running at the top of each hour for two minutes throughout the day. So really encourage you guys um, to sort of time yourself and then be able to be there and then enjoy this, um, this experience by yourself. Uh, on the hour. But where, okay, it's in Fulton, but where is it in Fulton? It's throughout the entire building, as long as there is a screen. And then all 52 will come up at the same time. They, they, are, they are synced. Um, so this is our popular uh, poetry motion uh, program that we were able to bring, bring, bring them back to life um, in 2012 after many years of break. Uh, right now, we collaborate with Society of America to select poems and then work closely with the um, MTA's senior designer to pair them with images of our work from our perm permanent art collection. Also, I am very excited to share uh, with you all that this poem can now be seen in the subway car as well as on digital screens throughout the system as well. It's not as easy to read. It's very, it's very difficult to read. Okay. To yeah, I'll definitely take that uh, feedback to our designer, and so um, we can improve on that. Helen Keller took over the Baruch College program that was very instrumental in working towards increasing the readability of this, and that may be a connection. I know you used to work with Karen um, Gorgi at Baruch. 
Uh, but that's really problematic, the gray. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, Excuse you me, since everybody else seems to be, be, I'm going to take two minutes right now in your presentation to tell you that before there was Arts for Transit, before there was everything else, there were two programs called Adopt a Station and Culture Station. And that was run by Rone Menchel from the board and by me. And those programs brought in money from developers, from outside people, and specifically Astor Place, which brought in money from Mrs. Astor, from the Astor Foundation, to match the capital money coming from the MTA. And we brought in Milton Glaser, and that was way before 1986. If you don't, I will be happy to sit down with you and fill in that missing part. Culture Stations was the Brooklyn Museum Station, was 53rd, which still has that, at one time had displays as well as the art in that station. There were two more, okay, I mean, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but there was an awful lot that you just skipped over completely. Right. And it existed, and it was a lot of hard work, not just me, not Rone, but a lot of hard people on the MTA staff, and a consultant, a woman named Alexia Lally, who worked full time on right. this, yeah. and everybody else. And if you don't know about it, I will be happy to bring you in, including the brochure which you have in the office. You may want to give to her, or else I'll find well, I, some I more. Thank you very much for fitting in that part of the Yeah, important. I know, but if you've been making this presentation and forgetting that something didn't just pop up in, in 1986 or whenever you said it happened. And your information about Astor Place is totally well, incorrect. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get Ya Ling the uh, culture station information and all right. of the No, history. I'll get it to her because you don't even have the whole, well, all of it. Well, and I, I would love that. Get it to um, Lisa. Yeah, but it is very disturbing to find Let's out that you're making now. this presentation. Well, um, my presentation yeah. is from is about a story when arts, arts and design was born. And as a um, my previous responsibility as an archivist, I do um, sort of I was this for I I do have this fortune to have uh, to read about um, that part of very important history. Um, prior to uh, my office creation. So I, I do very, very much uh, appreciate you filling in that information. Well, any material? She put a small presentation together for us. She didn't do it to offend anybody. Well, she offended me. Thank you. Oh. Sure. Okay, L that's okay, no problem. Um, all right. I'm sure we'll have time after my presentation, okay. Um, so then um, we also have this photographic light box program uh, featuring transportation related photographic exhibits at five locations. Um, this is uh, currently What's Up on View uh, at Bryan Park by uh, Jeanette May. And last but not the least, um, our music underground, uh, music under New York uh, program, um, which facilitates more than 7,500 annual performances at 30 locations in the MTA network. Uh, this year, uh, we host the um, auditions um, every year for one day. Uh, this year, our auditions will take place in Grand Central Terminal on May 7. It's uh, free and open to the public. Um, from 9 o'clock until around 3.30 in the afternoon. So just feel free to pop by. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to spend more time to talk about our um, permanent person for our program. Uh, to date, um, Arts and Design has commissioned over 350 projects, making us the largest public art initiative in the country and internationally. Both well-established and uh, emerging artists contributed to these growing collections of museum-quality artwork uh, for our writers in a variety of medias, including mosaic, ceramic tile, 
metal, glass, and other um, technologically integrated materials. In 2016, uh, system-wide efforts to introduce a group of pilot stations receiving improvements and envisioned design elements uh, took place. The works included structural enhancements, better wayfinding, um, modernized architectural finishes, industrial designs, and new art. For example, as you um, on this slide, as you enter the Bay Ridge subway station, artwork by Katie Fisher becomes a wayfinding visual cue um, as as one enters um, descends to the platform. The artwork referenced local history using imagined artifacts that could have been unearthed during the uh, Bay Ridge F station's excavation in the early 20th century. Art often enlivens the space and offers a strong visual identity, as uh, in Monica Bravo's work here uh, at Prospect Avenue. And this station at 30, 39th Ave, Dutch Kill uh, stations, is one of the four elevated stations that are totally transformed as part of these uh, improvement efforts. The vibrant glass projects by Sarah Morris can be seen from both the platform and the street below. The work invites the viewer to reflect upon the concept of motion, scale, light, and mapping. Uh, another station on the um, Astoria line in Queens uh, at uh, Broadway station, Diane Carr created our look. It's a um, imaginary color field landscape that references the past and presence of the neighborhood surrounding this, the station. The art, uh, mm, which is translated into laminated glass, became the station facade. The flow of natural light constantly casts sh dramatic shadows throughout the entire day. The artworks uh, enhance the architecture and the environment that the station resides in. I, I'm really happy because this is one of my projects. So um, when I read the news, I was super excited that um, in um, in uh, a recent press just last year in September, it was named as one of the eight most beautiful subway stations in the country. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, like the early um, Heinz and Lafarge decorative, decorative ceramics, our art speaks to the greater sense of place in which it's situated. Glass mosaic artwork by Fiole Bayas brings tropical plants and Caribbean symbols into this 163rd Street Amsterdam Avenue station. It's uh, situated in a, the station situated uh, in a uh, predominantly Domin Dominican neighborhood. Therefore, the artwork established a cultural um, connection and story um, speaking of to the surrounding community and welcome people into the station. In the Bronx at uh, 167th Street Station, Rico Gasson's artwork called Beacons uh, consists of a glass mosaic portraits that uh, to feature people who are influential um, within the community and on na national stage. It creates, it, the artwork creates a sense of pride and has become a destination unto him itself. Some of the figures included in this uh, important project are Audrey Lord, James Bowen, Reggie Jackson, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Roaming Underfoot uh, by Nancy Blum at 28th Street Station on the number six line has become a recent Instagram sensation. Um, the artist transformed her iconic study of botany into bold and expressive statement of art. When we opened up the station, um, it was an immediate hit on social media and was later be coined as the most ins Instagrammable subway station. Um, social media has greatly expanded our audience, and through these platforms, our work can engage broader audiences, connecting people and places throughout the world th um, through art. 
these improvements with new design elements are carried through to the commuter rail station as well. Um, just one instance at Brentwood Station on Long Island Railroad, the improved waiting area now features um, the um, modern amenities with art being in the um, center focus. At Crestwood Station on Metro North Railroad, Railroad our work by Trisha Wright um, now um, has been installed just very recently in the station's overpass uh, area in stunning glass. Uh, and with metal railings complemented this newly improved station facade. When talking, when thinking about where and how to place our work, arts and design takes our writers and the architectural context into mind. In fact, sometimes the art and the architecture are so enmeshed and they become one. Nestled at the uh, west end of the World Trade Center complex is the entrance to the newly opened uh, WTC Quillen Station. It's right there. <laughs> um, this rebuilt station offers a columnless view of the artwork, which covers a total of 4,350 square feet of the wall space, and it's it's totally integrated into the architectural um, design as the station finished. Title Chorus, the artwork is by international artist Anne Hamilton, and it features a woven peel of text taken from the US Declaration of Independence and the 1948 preamble of uh, Universal Dec Declaration of Human Rights. This expansive field of text framed the, sub the station's platform, creating an immersive environment and is inspiring public space to be experienced. This white-on-white -white, uh, tactile service invites our writers to touch the text as they read the words, um, creating a, a meaningful personal encounter. These underground crossings of text and people form an underground refrain that speak to the civil I civil civic ideas and aspirations foundation to the quality of life above ground. Um, it's quite a special project, especially considering where uh, it's situated. At Fulton Center in Lower Manhattan, um, sky reflector net, which is that soaring uh, monumental sculpture um, like overlooking the space. It's a collaboration between artists, architects, and the engineers. There are 952 reflective aluminum panels suspended um, in the ceiling that would fold the natural light um, in and then it bring it down to the bottom level of the center. So in this case, art becomes not just a beauty, but also it, it's a functional uh, uh, component uh, combining aesthetics and, and function to be able to conserve energy by close to 25%. A soft ferry, just right here, Doug and Mike Starn use metal, mosaic, and glass for a monumental installation called See It Split, See It Change. Um, this is just a partial element of the, uh, of the um, monumental installation for the station. The metal fence here is, here is, is a water jet cut stainless steel panel. Uh, it acts as a uh, fencing to separate the paid and from the unpaid. Another, uh, our, uh, my final example of this correlation between our work and station architecture um, is at the 34th Street uh, Hudson Yard Station with the st striking artwork by Zenobia Bailey. The art becomes a part of a greater hall, uh, as in become an integral part of the station and its architecture. These meaningful connections between people and place through the art can be seen in the over 320 artwork um, arts and design have installed thus far. Um, these, they are site specific and engage the writer in many ways. I would like to close my presentation just by showing you some of, the, some of those touching moments that we experienced. Here um, we have the kids uh, playfully interact 
with the mosaic portraits by uh, Chuck Close at the 86 Street stations on the Second Avenue subway line, and at the Second 72nd Street um, stations also on the Second Avenue subway line. Uh, Big Mooney's Perfect Strangers uh, is comprised of more than 3,000 characters representing the writers that we would encounter every day on the New York City subway, often creating personal connections with a uh, customer who can see themselves on or their loved ones in this representation scattered throughout the station. The work also encouraged a uh, playful discovery and enticed writers to take a pause along their journey. This is a somewhat earlier project that we uh, installed in 2010. It's called Bronx River View by Barbara Gwright Gudas. It's a functional sculpture with seating that blend the transit experience with the surrounding community and provide resting point with windows of the open air and sky views. Um, here we have um, on the opening days of the 145th Street Station, uh, the, um, a group of um, kids that came to visit the uh, stations as part of the field dates uh, led by the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Um, this is also one of our recent stations at um, 23rd Street Stations um, featuring the dogs. It's, it's quite popular if you have not had the opportunity to uh, visit the station. You should really go. It features William Wegman's uh, stationary figures uh, with 11 glass mosaic panels of his own fame, where a manner um, portraits. The dogs take some human attributes from wearing street clothes like a shiny raincoat or a flannel, flannel shirt to being grouped like passengers as they gaze into space or peer down the platform as if they are waiting for the train as, as well. Of, of, over these past many, many years, including um, those people who have strived to make Subway a better commuting environment uh, before arts and design, uh, we often wonder and ask uh, the question ourselves that, Although we receive many positive feedbacks and press, but do art really serve our, our writers well? Um, it's kind of difficult to come up with a, um, a, stati a stats to kind of support our mission. Luckily, in 2013, um, there was a quantitative study on the value of public art in the MTA system that was done by a uh, graduate student whose name is Naomi Se Sexius. Uh, this project was her gradu graduate thesis uh, as an architecture student. The finding is that, yes, art does matter. Through her, um, she actually went to uh, five stations across the borough and handed out close to 3,000 surveys. From her uh, study results, it shows 91% of writers feel art contributes to a better commute, and 96 would like to see more. Uh, so this is very encouraging. Uh, we know that this process has served us well, the agency and our customers well as well. It has resulted in a diverse collection of outstanding public artworks that we pride as New York's underground art museum. We have been successful because people who use the place know this work were created for them. Success um, is almost inevitable if, if your goal is to be mindful of who you are creating the art for and the place where, where it, it will exit, 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 sorry. Um, so thank you, thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, what I share today is just a small selection of what we do uh, at um, Arts and Design. I hope you follow us on our social media, as you can see it there on the screen, and check us out on our website as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Yaoli. And one of the tributes to all of the artwork you showed is that they're not defaced, that people actually respect them. They, they, they do, yeah. Once they know that actually we are creating this for them, 
and they feel that they they own it, and so then that would be where they would sort of like wanted to be able to take care of our stations. Yeah, yeah. One of the first stations that ever got a treatment was 81st Street Museum of Natural History, which is, yeah, and um, that has not. I mean, uh, when there was graffiti on lots of other stations, that one didn't get any. So let's take a few questions. We got some sure, time. Sure, Edith. Please. Now, first of all, I have to say, my I got it. Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. thank you. Uh, 184th elevators had posters originally, and all of them were defaced. Every single poster from the collection. Um, is there 184th? Yes, 181st Street at 184th Street. Um, is there any statistic on um, the artwork that is visit that is in accessible spaces? Um, like at Dykeman, there is a piece of artwork. It is an accessible station, at least going downtown, that's on a stairwell that I obviously will never see. Um, there's most of this artwork seems to be in locations that certainly is not accessible to myself as a person with disability. Um, I'm used to dirty walls. We don't have artwork in Washington Heights in general. Excuse me. Now, it could be on the new, on the, the, on the inaccessible stations, but there is probably artwork was put in at 168th Street. I will never know. Right. There is some artwork at 168th, I mean, one, 190th. Um, it blends into the tunnel street, um, but in general, you know, unless something, and all the stations that they did along Central Park West, which are not accessible after being redone, they have artwork. So we're really having a lovely set of artwork for people who can get to it. Right. A and you don't have a problem with that? Not at all. I mean... And do I like not it. deserve to have art also? You do, you do. Uh, I have good news uh, for the uh, the new Astoria Boulevard station on the end. Um, we are putting in, I think, three elevators, and there will be art there. So that's one. Okay, there are 468 stations, at 472. It depends on who's counting. Um, how many of those have artwork? I do not have that stats. Okay, right that would me, be very I'll, interesting. I I'm happy to. Um, I mean, other than that, that hideous mosaic work at 42nd and 34th. I mean, those are pretty hideous. To be very honest. subjective. Okay, <laughs> so I will say I'm an elitist, and I think those are both. And 81st Street will be getting elevators, and 96th on the Central Park West Line in 10 years if we're lucky uh no it should be much sooner than that um let can we take some a couple of yeah. but yeah that's that would be really interesting to know if yeah if yeah. all sections yeah. of stations are looked at when yeah uh, lisa did you have something yeah, and then chris a quick question then, um how do how does one get one station into the mix like how are the stations selected the station to to have artwork uh, we are part. We actually we operate under the uh, five-year capital program. Um, so, as per the um, MTA Austin Design Policy, uh, we would be eligible to receive up to one percent of the construction budgets um, in for station that would be uh, renewed or rehabbed um, in under the capital um, program. And from there, we would be able to work with the capital uh, planning and budget to determine um, the stations and uh, locations and opportunity for our. Does that include CBTC installation along the line? Uh, CB that I am not sure. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that's not I part of what we do. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Chris and then Trudy. Trudy. First of all, I seen a lot of the art, and just just, and I agree with Edith. But some stations don't have it in accessible stations right now. Yeah, Storia Boulevard is getting an elevator, but that's that's good for right now. But getting into the other boroughs in Brooklyn, I'll say, thank God, at 62nd Street and New Trick, where the new elevators are. Yes, you have art there for the connection to the D and N train. Um, 
One thing and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm glad Lisa Dackley did say, but I want to know is if, say, like an artist, and I discussed this with you earlier, um, with a lot of artists, people, and I'm not using the D, double D, I'm just using one D, disability people do draw a lot of good art also, and they've been announcing this more in the Transit Museum. Is there a way in the future, like in some stations, we can see other artists um, a going? A rotating show. Thank you. Say it. Thank you. Rotate show because a lot of them like to do art and they like to, you know, work with, you know, you guys. They they love the station. Every time I see them on stations that are not ADA accessible, but some of them just love looking at your station. And I know Sheeps at Bay is getting an elevator soon. I hope we can work on something with a lot of beautiful art there because that will increase a lot is of more people. There, I just said my questions. Okay. Trudy? First of all, I want to apologize if I appear to be rude, but you can understand, I hope you will understand, well, I was accused by Scott who has left of being rude, so I just want you to, but, but I ask you how you would feel if you heard a presentation being made about something that you started with some other very, very dedicated people and four years of your life totally wiped out by, in a presentation. And I will be happy to sit down. You say you're the archivist. I don't know if you got the book that we did with the New York Public Library on the Culture Stations Project and, and the pamphlet which they have in the office, but I will bring you in your own copy. And I will be happy to sit down with you and go over so that for future presentations, you can understand how this started under Dick Ravitch, who made it, who went to Rone Menchel. Dick Ravitch was the chairman of the MTA at that time. And there was a man named David Plavin who was the CEO. And the two of them pushed, th made this happen with Rone Menchel on the board. And I'm glad you mentioned Rone, but there were a lot of other dedicated staff people also. So let's, we'll get her. Okay, no, I, I am trying to be, yeah, I rarely apologize. Limit. You know, you let everybody else talk, go on and on no, and I on. Oh, come on. Okay, we now I would like to, fine, week. I would just like to tell you, I, forget about it, Andrew. You know, I was making an apology for being you rude, and now Very you're nice. being rude to me. I am also trying to give clock, some Trudy. other information to people around this table about what oh. existed during, from 1979. I'm, I'm aware of it, too. Yeah, but uh, some of the other people around this table may not be. And when a presentation is made, maybe the history should be included. But that's Judy, okay. We'll whatever you send to us, we'll share with everybody, okay? Thank you. I will send it directly to Yaling. Yale, Yaling Thank okay? you. Okay? And Thank I'll you. be happy to sit down with her. I'm making this okay. for Great. the record to sit down so that Thank can you. be corrected. Okay. Because it was before. Sharon. Um, Mike. Are there thematic um, considerations per, for so that the things in one line are similar, or uh, is this all sort of? They're interesting projects, but are they all willy nilly? Is there any cohesive design consideration? Um, in terms of art itself, we don't just predetermine a theme or a subject for the artist, but um, during this selection process, we would provide all the materials necessary, including the, um, the history and cultural, uh, like kind of uh, demographic um, materials of uh, the, the site or the station to the artist. And oftentimes, they would just um, um, take into uh, conducting uh, in-depth um, research and so for the for whatever proposal uh, uh the art proposal that would be selected as uh, the result of the uh, selection panel um the art oftentimes is site specific and speaks to the to the community where the station resides so that that would be the underlining connect connectiveness that i would say thanks um Ellen and, and uh, Stuart, and you know, we're running out of time for old and new business, but please, go ahead, Ellen. Okay. Um, so years ago, and I'm sorry I'm not up to date, you had an app, and it was fascinating because it was the, the, the subway system 
as an art gallery and you could pull you could put in your station yeah. and it talked about the artist and all that went into the creation that of the art good. is that still going that app well, that you had because it was wonderful i know unfortunately i worked on that app as well and um <laughs> We were able to tap into very limited resources and has a kind of startup company that's based uh, out on the West Coast to develop that for us pro bono. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, they were um, bought by larger company like HP and then they become to kind of charge fees which we just couldn't afford. So we had to make a decision to kind of take it down. but. Um, the good news is right now we are working internally with our colleagues in transit uh, um, under Sarah's group to uh, redesign, completely redesign our website. So I'm hoping sometimes uh, this year uh, we'll have a brand new site that's uh, user friendly and mobile responsive. Uh, and from there, because for that you can just use your phone and then you're you'll be able to go to our site and then right. Excellent. So that's a uh, good. Uh, can I just add to that something that you had a one long ten years ago? I just found them a wonderful, like a little booklets, and you did you did them for three different editions called Art on oh, the really? Line, Art and rules. they were just. I know in this age of electronics. Nobody likes to have actually a book or something that they can have, but they were absolutely wonderful because they went station by station and also gave a history of the whole program. You may want to, since the app doesn't exist anymore, at least put that on. I mean, and I will lend you my copies if you don't have them in your archives. And uh, you can take screenshots and just send them out also. The same thing with some of the articles that I will give you. That yeah, there are we'll screen to, shots because be this was be long before we had uh, uh, social media or or electronic media or anything. So that would be great if you paper. could get her that too. I am going to go sit down with her Good. and give her all my files. Excellent. Okay, Stuart. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, three little points. Um, do you still have postcards that are available yeah. to? Uh, the public with some of the uh, we, we do have some postcards right. and yeah. where would one find them yeah. um, today I mean I know at the transit museum hmm? at the uh, transit, transit museum they have transit. Uh, you can find our poster or our car at the transit museum store right. and um, I'm, I'll be happy to kind of pick out a few um, postcards for you guys I can just deliver to your office Great. okay and yeah. two more little things so would you be able to say what percentage of the art installations are actually on stations versus mezzanines? You know, I was listening to my colleagues today about accessibility, and as a charter member of the Transit Museum, I've extensively toured stations th with the Arts for Transit program when it was called that, and a lot of things were on, sta on station platforms versus mezzanines. So. Right. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, yeah. statistics that I'm going to also put together along with uh, your yours, right. so that I can because give I it think to you guys. I think those with physical disabilities that maybe can't access right. a station at its entry point can get to a platform th from a train from an accessible station because many of the installations Entrances are on stations versus platforms are on stations. versus mezzanines. They're on physical stations. Yeah. But my question is. Um, you mentioned there was very little vandalism, but if there is, is there a budget to address installation vandalism? Excellent question. <laughs> so, um, really, my my talks really is I guess started off from the initiation of arts and design. Um, so we are approaching 35 years, uh, if not already, and so since the year one, um, we have this incredible. Uh, number of collections that uh, we install uh, in throughout the MTA system and we are also today facing uh, aging um, collections. Uh, every day goes by, it, it will become older naturally uh, like a human life. So we have our in-house uh, conservation program that we have uh, our staff member who would go out regularly every day to survey the artwork at the station. If there's any like minor chip and tear there, here and there, or a gum or some uh, tagging, we'll just take care of it ourselves. But when a substantial conservation or cleaning um, 
task would be required, we would work with um, uh, the, the station cleaning crew, which we are working very closely with. It also, will, uh, when it's uh, necessary, we'll contract um, artisans, like professional fabricators, to come back and then um, conduct conservation work. Thank you. But the, the money that's set aside to uh, develop and install the um, works that are referenced in the uh, capital contracts, it references the percentage of the amount that could yes. be dedicated. Maybe as they consider future ones going forward with the new plan that there's a provision set aside for maintenance or, um, or upkeep. You know, that would be great. That and would do, be the, great. do the group station managers report damage to, to Arts for Transit? Yes. They do. Yeah. We have our channel. Okay. Yeah. Um, Edith. And then we're going to go. It's, you know, it's important to look at the artwork and realize it's a different encounter. For example, okay. at um, when you're switching from the Lexington to the A no. whatever. The neon beehive, as I think Good. of it, the honeycomb, is a different experience. You know, you, you see it from the escalator. I see it from the platform. It's a totally different experience. The, um, on the, on the, um, the artwork, the flowers hanging over the station, um, it's 96, 96. right? 96. It does not have the impact for me as it does for everyone going up the escalator. Similarly, 59th Street, you showed that, you know, I, it's a different encounter because I'm seeing it from the one level. It's different experience if you're not going up and down the steps. I would just like to think that there was an awareness of that when an artist brings forth such a situational piece of art that it's being experienced differently if you can't go up and down the stairwell. Just asking for a little yeah. awareness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you right. did that very well. And um, thank you so much again, well, Yang Thank Ling. you. Thank you. And um, thank you so much. because we must exit the room. Um, I just want to wrap up with Stuart. You have asked um, correctly to ensure that we are documenting our uh, follow-ups. Um, and so I just wanted to, to show you that, in fact, we do have the follow-ups on a spreadsheet, um, but also uh, have some follow-ups to some of the things that have been raised at the last meeting that I brought, but we've run out of time, so we'll send them. Accessible. I'm very frustrated. This will be the third fourth. Fulton. What was the fourth one that was not accessible? Oh, that's right. I forgot about that one. Um, it's very frustrating. Now, when we had the last East Side Access trip that I was basically banned from, I am once more not. And I asked at that time, that we have a different, I know it's before your time, don't worry Bradley. Um, it, it, I asked at that time that we so do, do something like a video of where, we, where it is now and nothing's ever happened. I mean, even when we went to that stoop, when we went to the yard in, um, by City Field, Oh, yeah, I that mean, was not accessible. No. Yeah. So I, Edith, and Metz Willis Point me, continues to still Edith, not I don't be know if you saw my response to Yes, your I did. No. I saw your okay. response. So I'm this was, we tried to make this, we you know tried, to tried to only to make this an accessible I chore. tried to get us a private train yeah. to take us through Harold and through yep. um, uh, some of the new track work. You don't know how hard I tried to do that. I really did. And Phil Eng and I were, were pretty close, and then at the last minute he said, my people said, this part is not accessible. I had a private train lined up for us. You did. Well, I think that it's it's a. Yeah, I'm I'm just tired of this crap. I mean, we went through this with Fulton. I was banned from the Fulton trip. I've now been banned in effect from two East Side Access trips. This is ridiculous. East Side Access is obviously a problem. It's not local. 
but I'm asking for an accommodation, which is to say, take some video of it. Well, that's what I asked for the last time, and we didn't do it. Because she wasn't here. You got Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you guys were not here. That's what I just said to Bradley before your time, before um, Lisa's time. But I, I need to know that there. I mean, my original email to you was that. Well, uh, that would have been. No, 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 no. I need to be. I need to know that we are trying to do this. Okay. Okay, what I'm saying is instead of letting it, me to get in, get the email back from you after not getting the original email, you know, I mean, now do you understand it? I got it. I can take a video if you want. Fine. Can you, can you get me out? Mm -hmm. Well, you had it to me.